next speaker is Joshua Rapp. He is a postdoctoral associate in the biology department at Caltech University, working with Dr. Elizabeth Crow. His research is on tree demography, with a focus on the masting. Um, Joshua has done studies on cone production in white bark pine in Montana, and is now focused on understanding the resource dynamics of masting in sugar maple and its implications for sap sugar levels. Joshua earned his BS degree from Duke University, his master's from the University of Vermont, and PhD from Wake Forest University. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, as my title says, I'll be talking about the relationship between masting and maple syrup production today. Um, but I'd like to start out by just acknowledging my collaborator at, at Tufts, Elizabeth Crone, and the organizations that have provided support or data for this um, project, including the Vermont Mining Cooperative, and uh, especially like to thank Sandy Wilmot for uh, providing some of the data that has made it on the BMC website. Um, start with a tree. Uh, humans provide many, uh, get many benefits from trees, and it's largely, almost exclusively based on the fact that trees can use um, sunlight to turn carbon dioxide and water into sugars. The trees then use this, these sugars for running the metabolism of a tree and including things like growing wood, which we use a lot of, especially here in Vermont. Um, but to a tree, all this photosynthesis and growth is, is just a means to an end. Um, and that end for trees, like every other organism, is to maintain and spread their genes in the environment. And to do this, trees make seeds. Um, so that brings me to masting. Masting is the uh, episodic and synchronous production of seeds uh, across the population. Um, this, this is a, a common masting pattern where you either have high seed production or low seed production. Um, masting is thought to have evolved <coughs> because of uh, various density-dependent benefits of concentrating reproduction in certain years, um, including increasing pollination efficiency, attracting seed dispersers, and um, having their seeds escape seed predator predators in mass years. Um, and while these mechanisms provide an evolutionary impetus for masting to evolve, they don't actually explain how masting happens approximately year to year basis. One possible mecha mechanistic um, explanation for masting is, is described in the resource budget model. The resource budget model starts with the observation that producing a lot of seeds takes a lot of energy, a lot of resources. Um, during mast years, reproductive litter fall can often uh, equal or exceed the amount of vegetative litter fall. Um, in, by, by individual trees and, and stands. Um, and for deciduous trees that flower before leaves come out in the spring, they have to use stored resources to support that flowering, um, generally by using non-structural carbohydrates, which are the energy reserves of the tree. Um, I kind of like to think of this research budget model as fundraising, but instead of a soccer team raising money to buy new jerseys or something, um, the tree is storing away non-structural carbohydrates so that they can produce seeds. Uh, the RBM, the shorthand for the resource budget model, um, works like this. Trees are photosynthesizing, creating sugars. They store those sugars away over time until they get to a threshold. Then they can flower and produce seeds. That depletes resources, and they can start over again. Uh, this model was formalized in 1997 by Sagi and colleagues, and the theory behind it has been expanded and refined over the years, but empirical tests remain rather rare, um, which is where I kind of came in. I was interested in testing the RBM in sugar maple. That's what I've been working on for my postdoctoral research. Sugar maple makes um, a, a good tree to study massing for several reasons. In particular, for today, I'm going to focus on the fact that people use the non-structural carbohydrates of sugar maples to make maple syrup. 
and that is a, a fact they can exploit when they're looking at resource dynamics of trees, and then also provides an interesting interaction between some theoretical science and a forest product. So the question is, does masting affect syrup production? Um, if we assume that the non-structural carbohydrates that support flowering uh, in the spring are this, come from the same pool that maple producers tap when they collect sap to make into syrup, we can expect there to be a relationship between seed production and syrup production. So let's start with two predictions. One, resources should be high just before flowering. And two, masting should deplete those resources so that um, levels of non-structural carbohydrates, and hence the amount of sugar in sap, should be lower after masting. As I mentioned before, I used data from uh, Vermont Monitoring Cooperative on seed production. Um, these are from the, the North American Maple Project, which in Vermont is overseen by BMC. Um, these data come from 31 stands across the state uh, and represent about 8,900 stems in this, in this figure. This figure shows the proportion of tree, mature trees fruiting in any given year. You can see that there are, are, are definite mass years um, and a high level of synchrony across sites across the whole state. This maple syrup production data I used uh, comes from the National Agricultural Statistics Service, um, which, is, which tracks maple syrup production over time. And what we see is that over the last decade, we've had a, 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 lot, a strong increase in, um, in syrup production. So to account for this, I detrended the data by fitting two linear regressions, one before 2002 and one after 2002, and then used the residuals of that of those regressions in further analyses, which is what is shown on the, on the bottom graph here. And what we see is that on the, in the left-hand figure, CERT production is, is positively related to seed production in in the same year. So if there's a, a high flowering year, it was likely that there was high syrup in that same spring. And the figure on the right shows the, um, the proportion of trees with seeds in the previous year and its relation to syrup production. And there we see a, uh, a negative effect. That is, um, in the year after a mast year, syrup production declines. So both of the um, predictions there are, are supported. But what about weather? Uh, it's common knowledge for maple producer, maple syrup producers that weather during the tapping season determines sap flow, and the more sap you are able to collect, you should be able to produce more syrup. This is this happens to be data from Harbor Forest, from some trees that tap there, but this has been shown um, in large geographic areas to work as well. These are two different studies from Quebec where they looked at the effect of uh, mean temp of temperature and precipitation, uh, monthly temperature and precipitation data on syrup production and found that there indeed was predictive power to climate in syrup production. Um, so to look at this, I used climate data from the PRISM climate group. This is gridded data that's extrapolated from weather stations across the United States. Um, and I used the minimum and maximum temperatures from January through April plus the total winter precipitation, since these have been uh, shown to be useful in, in other studies. Um, I first fit all uh, regression models with all possible combinations of, of these variables plus seed production, and then used uh, an information theoretic approach to choose the best models, which in this case I, I um, define as being those with a delta ASE of less than 10. I won't go too much into the statistical details of this. Um, but these figures show that on the top here is the relative importance, which is the proportion of those best models that a, a given predictor showed up in. As we can see, seed production shows up in almost all of the models, while most of the um, 
climate variables show up in only a few, with maybe temperature in April being, being an ex exception. Um, the figure on the bottom left shows the quantitative effect of each um, predictor on syrup production. Again, we see that seeds have a strong negative, seeds in the previous year have a strong negative effect on syrup production. Well, while most of the climate variables are near zero and showing that they have very little effect at all, except again, uh, maybe April temperature is pretty important, maybe important. Over on the right side, I choose I look at just the best models that include only seeds, so that's just one model. Um, the best model that only included climate variables, and then the best model that included both seeds and climate. And this shows the R squared, or the proportion of variance explained in uh, syrup production data. And again, we see that the seeds only model uh, explains much more of uh, the variability in the data than the climate only model. Although the seeds and climate model um, explain the most variation. So there's probably a role for both of these in there, although it looks like um, seed production is, is perhaps more important um, or better predicting. Um, in summary, uh, this analysis shows that masting depletes sap sugar, leading to lower maple syrup production. Um, and that seed production was a better predictor than climate for um, syrup production. And just to uh, wrap things up, if you don't take anything else from this talk, you may now have a mental image for what non-structural carbohydrates are. Um, this also, this study also gives a, an example of theory informing practice, which is maybe kind of rare. Um, the only reason I looked for a relationship between syrup and seeds was because of this masking theory. But this information could be used by maple producers, for instance, when deciding when to expand tapping uh, operations. You probably wouldn't want to do that following a past year, for instance. And finally, um, climate change models are being used to predict or to forecast uh, may forecast about the maple syrup industry in the future, and it may be useful to consider masking patterns in those models. Um, with that, if there's any time, I'll take any questions. So is that um, decrease in yields after a masking year uh, a result of less sap collecting, or the, because the sap wasn't as sweet? Um, so we can't tell that from this data. Yeah. From uh, studies I've done at Harvard Forest, we get uh, but there's the sap sugar content after a mass year is lower, it's lower. And, and fairly significant. Uh, I actually think that the maple syrup producers would be very interested in this, uh, particularly since unlike the weather, it's actually predictively almost a year ahead of time. And, right. Uh, and if there was some, you know, I would think like talking to the maple syrup, uh, you know, the, they got the, whatever the NGO is that talk, they, right, the, anyway, then the feeding some kind of prediction yeah. every year to the maple syrup producers would be a really powerful use of this uh, cool information that we figured out. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we definitely would like to do that. Yeah, I was wondering, do you know if this year was the last year? Um, well, I haven't seen the data for Vermont, and I wasn't up here, so I don't know. But in uh, Massachusetts, it was, and I, it seems that things are fairly consistent across that right. geographic area. So I, would say, uh, I was just thinking yeah. from, at, from orchards. Orchards had a lot of flowers yeah. this year. It was sort of bumpy year, but orchards had plenty of flowers. Um, yeah, so it does. I, I noticed that too in a lot of areas that there were a lot of different species, orchards, um, maples, I've seen beech with a lot of seeds, I've seen spruce with a lot of seeds this year. So it does seem to be there's there's something going on in the environment that has, has um, made this year a particular good seed year. So that, that does happen, but that doesn't always happen. It's, uh, it's not always true that species, different species are in, in the same thing. Well, is there an easy way now that you can check the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative website and go, oh, okay, last year was a uh, massive year, or is, that, is it not? Um, the data isn't that updated. <laughs> it should, right now on the website, it just goes to 2007. And I actually haven't, this, the data I showed here today just goes to 2011. I haven't gotten the last two years.
So, does it go the other way around? Would seed production in the sugar bush be lower than in the surrounding untapped tree? Um, I don't think so. Um, so, and I guess I have actually looked at that. The 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 stand about of the stands that are monitored, about half are in sugar bushes and half are out, and I haven't seen any difference in the seed production between those two groups. Um, just to note for people who need to get somewhere else, it is after two fifteen, and our next uh, presentation is Tuesday.